right off the bat, if you got a little razzed up by the provocative thumbnail, nowhere in this film am I going to discuss graded exercise therapy. It's in the bin. Don't do it. End of. And in a head-to-head -head fight, obviously pacing beats pushing. Pushing gets disqualified before the bell even rings. But, and you probably knew there was going to be a but, didn't you? If we're recovering, or at least wanting to recover, how do we go about trying to do more without triggering relapse or worsening symptoms? And what role is there for autonomic conditioning? Which, for the avoidance of doubt, I'm describing as the process whereby we try to gently trigger a dysautonomic response, only to then quickly stop and rest. The idea being that we can retrain our autonomic system to not go mad at the slightest prompt. Again, for clarity, the difference from graded exercise is twofold. First, the level of activity. In autonomic conditioning, we're talking about lying on your back and moving your legs a bit, uh, versus going for a 15 minute walk or a jog or actual exercise that's designed to pump up your heart rate. And secondly, the fact that GET is designed to be done irrespective of symptoms before, during or after, which is absolutely the worst idea ever. But before we can address the hows, whys and wherefores of doing more or autonomic conditioning, I think we have to go back to talking about what's actually going on in the body. Let's start with Professor Scheibenbogen's paper in Nature Communications, which identifies two groups of long haulers, differentiated by the time frame in which they suffer post-exertional symptom exacerbation, which going forwards I'm just going to call PEM for brevity. These two groups are also differentiated by symptoms. Now I need to point out that what follows is my current thinking, a theory if you will, based upon the body of scientific evidence that we have up till now and using this paper as a final jumping off point. I'm not aware of anything else out there that breaks it down in the way I'm about to describe, but by all means let me know if there is. So, our first group has symptoms much like ME-CFS, with delayed PEM. The primary symptoms of this group are crushing fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, pain, which is, often takes them off headaches, uh, but can be any kind of pain, um, and autonomic dysfunction. So, tachycardia, palpitations, dizziness, dodgy temperature regulation, GI issues, this list is really long. Exercise intolerance is experienced in the present, but overdoing it is also accompanied by a systemic crash, usually the next day and lasting sometimes days. Think you might be in this group? Well, have a look at the Canadian criteria for ME-CFS. The link is in the description. Answer yes to all the questions and you can join me in this super cool club. Now, the other group are those who suffer from exercise intolerance more in the present and in the period immediately following. Their symptoms might be things like chest pain, shortness of breath, nerve pain or tingling, tinnitus, vision problems, muscle weakness, and loads more horrible stuff too. I mean, we've got 205 recognised symptoms for long COVID. Not quite sure if you experience PEM or quite what it feels like, then I'd wager you're probably in this second group. Now, yes, we can get into slicing and dicing the phenotypes of long COVID further, and in fact, I do so in the long COVID handbook. But for our present purposes, let's just stick with these two. And why is it worth breaking up long haulers into these two groups? Because I believe it can help us work out where we are individually in terms of pathophysiology and what might be appropriate for us in terms of doing more or autonomic conditioning. Long COVID is a spectacularly heterogeneous condition, and so any time we talk about this stuff, we are going to be by nature generalising. There is never going to be a one-size-fits-all answer, or indeed two sizes fits all. But hopefully the thinking I'm going to go through will help you personally put together your own likely unique jigsaw puzzle that drives your own condition. So, in what world is doing more dangerous? Well, if you're in the first group, that resembling ME-CFS, then you're going to have to be very careful. You've likely already found out the limits of your energy envelope, which is the total sum of what you can do in a day without blowing yourself up. And what happens if you exceed them? So, whatever you do, respect those limits. Don't even think about doing more if every day you wake up with PEM. 
The first job here, of course, is identifying what are your personal PEM signifiers. For me, it's a horrible headache, like right here between the eyes, kind of up in the sinuses. Pushing against PEM in the hopes that that will expand your energy envelope is a terrible idea. You should absolutely not do it. But can you perhaps do autonomic conditioning work if you can do so without overspending your spoons? I would say cautiously, Yes, but more on this in a sec. Equally, if you feel like you're doing better and haven't had PEM in a while, can you roll the dice on activities or even that dirty word exercise? If in doing so you don't overspend your new amount of spoons, maybe. Of course, we don't necessarily know how many spoons we've got at any given time or on any given day because the number randomly changes. So the critical thing here is to increase very gradually and leave several days between each attempt at pushing the boat out. If you manage to do something and not experience PEM three days later, then you could consider gently doing a touch more. Consider any arrival of PEM as a hard no judgment on your antics. So aside from being the penalty for overspending spoons, what exactly is this nefarious PEM? Well, we don't have any academic consensus yet on what causes it, just a bunch of theories. But here's where I personally would go with it. I'd like to propose that PEM is a combination of some or all of an increase in chronic inflammation, a metabolic and mitochondrial energy crisis, and ischemic oxygen reperfusion injury. That crushing fatigue? I'd argue that this is a consequence of having spent more ATP than the body is capable of replacing. Mitochondrial and metabolic dysfunction along with oxygen perfusion issues limit our ability to replace the energy we've spent, and after a period of time the body shuts down to protect its basic processes and organ function. Wondering why you can never experience this level of fatigue when healthy, and also why no one else understands what it's like? Well, it's because no matter how many all-nighters you do and marathons you run, you can't ever deplete your ATP stocks below this critical level when your metabolic and mitochondrial processes are running normally. This would also explain why you can get crushing PEM fatigue from a day of brain work at a desk, not just physical activity. It's about energy spent, and the brain is a gas guzzler. It's not necessarily about muscles, physical cardio efforts, or, in my opinion, that idea of pumping bits of viral debris around the body. So this energy crisis is one massive part of the puzzle that's a symptom generator for us if we're in the first MECFS-like group. If you're in the second, well, the PEM you experience might be very different. Perhaps an increase in chronic inflammation will drive your PEM symptoms, but I'd wager you're not suffering from quite the same degree of metabolic or mitochondrial crisis. And how does autonomic conditioning fit into this? Well, dysautonomia is another massive driver of symptoms, certainly for the first group and likely for the second group too. Although not all dysautonomia is the same, those experiencing POTS are not having the same issues as those with headaches and GI problems. But if you find your heart races, you get dizzy and palpitations upon very light activity, well then you might benefit from physical autonomic conditioning. Let's pause here for a second to remind ourselves what autonomic conditioning is. Everything from meditation and breath work through to physical things like gentle yoga, reclining exercises, or even perhaps gentle upright activity. And at the extreme end, potentially even something that could loosely be called sport. But keep your hair on, I'll come to that. I'm not talking about kickboxing or doing bleep tests. Meditation and breath work I've talked about a lot on my channel before. It's designed to try and calm down the sympathetic nervous system that's gone haywire into a state of constant fight or flight. And get our bodies back into the parasympathetic state where it can rest, digest and heal. The same applies to gentle reclining or seated yoga. Reclining exercises were discussed in this film with Dr. David Petrino. The idea being that even if you're suffering from POTS, you can still try and work on improving the nervous system's overreactivity. And autonomic training can conceivably extend to anything you do, which you can do a little of and then pause. So into this group, you could have walking, cycling and swimming, but probably not 11 aside competitive football or a spin class. Obviously, all of this is completely dependent on how tolerant you are of any of these levels of activity. 
If having a shower wipes you out for a day, you'd be wise to not try anything beyond breath work. And even then, some people who suffer this severely can even find breath work challenging. Equally, some long haulers out there are now back at maybe 60, 70, or even 80% capacity. And if you're one of those, then a short walk or flat gentle cycle might be on the menu. The critical trick here is that as soon as your heart rate starts rising, you stop, and you wait until it's back at a normal rest level. How do you decide what your heart rate cutoff level is? Well, that's going to be specific for you and will depend on what's normal or not normal for you. It's often said that you'd take 0.55 of your maximum, where your maximum would be 220 minus your age. So you could use that, but fundamentally you're going to have to feel this out according to what drives your symptoms and what you can tolerate. And of course, whatever your walk or cycle or swim consists of, you need to be able to do it without subsequently experiencing PEM. Because if you do, you're probably doing more harm than good. This is where being in the second group helps. That is, if you're the right kind of dysautonomic. I told you it was a complex subject, didn't I? One final related point on this working theory of mine, not all crashes are the same. Spending too many spoons and pemming yourself is the classic crash for group oneers. But we also need to be aware of the nervous system crash, where too much time spent in sympathetic overdrive can then lead to crashing the nervous system into the freeze or immobilization state. For more on the polyvagal theory, uh, look up Dr. Stephen Porges or watch this film I made with Dr. Sally Riggs. Now, of course, differentiating the two types of crashes from symptoms alone can be difficult, but it's worth being aware of the kind of nervous system triggers, like protracted high stress levels, which are another route to things going south. I'm going to round off my thesis by talking about my personal experience. Back at the start of the year, I took some time off to focus on my health and recovery. In the process, I decided to do some of my own, perhaps somewhat punchy, autonomic training. And yes, to do this, I went out to the Alps. My plan was to reduce environmental triggers, escape toxic, wet, miserably wintry London, cut out work, add some joy, and work on my dysautonomia. Now, for context, I don't have POTS, but I do get tacky upon mild exertion, which then becomes dizziness and palpitations if I don't stop. Before going away, I could perhaps manage uh, 15 minutes farting about around the house before the wheels would start to fall off. So I went to the Alps and designed a plan. I'd start off with short bursts of gentle skiing, perhaps 15 or 20 seconds at a time, and then rest for a minute before descending again. I'd get to the bottom of the run in a few minutes, and then there'd be a chairlift so I could sit and do breath work for another 5 or 10 minutes. I was on the mountain by about 9 o'clock in the morning and off it again by about 10 o'clock. And the entire rest of the day was spent resting. So essentially what I was doing was spending five of my six spoons on that activity in the first hour of the day, which meant that the rest of the 23 hours of the day had to just spend one spoon. So it was absolutely critical that I spent that time resting and not messing about trying to do work or emails or phone calls or the rest of it. And generally speaking, this measuring out of the spoons worked, apart from one glorious bluebird powder day where I did six runs of freshies and then uh, suffered the next day. I did three weeks out in the Alps the first time I was out in January and another three weeks in March, gently building up the volume I was doing every day. I noticed that over time I could go faster and go longer between stopping and before my heart rate would start to increase. I also want to point out that whilst skiing sounds dramatic because, you know, it's fast, whoosh, zoom, swoop, swoop, and all that, if you're a good skier, it's actually quite energy efficient, much more so even than walking, for example. So spoons-wise, the cost of spending an hour on the mountain was probably only equivalent to me doing a 10 or 15 minute walk. Anyway, now that I'm home, what were the results? Well, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is that my overall energy envelope hasn't really increased. In any given day, how many spoons I have to spend hasn't changed that much. But, good news, my farting about tolerance has increased significantly. Now I can be on my feet for an hour, and upon then resting or lying down, my HR will normally fall back pretty quickly, indicating decent autonomic control. I will eventually still get tacky if I push it, but this is a very welcome improvement, albeit a bit of a trap as it lures you into doing more. Which, if you haven't increased the number of spoons in your cutlery drawer, is a rather pemmy problem. So through the lens of this example, let's try and sum up what I'm saying. 
We've got two groups of long haulers, one more ME-CFS-like and one with symptoms that don't fit into the classic ME-CFS mould. And these groups are primarily differentiated by when they experience PEM. For the first group, it's powerful and it's delayed. For the second group, it's more immediate. And a slight nuance here, the term PEM is frequently used to describe the systemic crash that comes the following day for the first group, while post-exertional symptom exacerbation, or PESE, describes individual worsening symptoms, an experience that is inclusive to both, but perhaps more specifically useful to the second group. Activity-wise, our first group is limited by spoon count and dysautonomia. The second group is more limited by the intensity of the symptoms they experience rather than spoon count, but they are potentially also dysautonomic. So both groups can potentially benefit from autonomic conditioning, with the obvious observation that this is a big generalization and not all long haulers are dysautonomic. The distinction between groups is important, as if you're in the first group, any autonomic conditioning work you do has to be achievable inside your spoon quota. And for either group, it also has to be pitched just right so as not to trigger a nervous system crash. Will autonomic conditioning work increase your spoon count if you have one? I don't think so. The same also applies to doing more in a general sense or pushing against your PEM limit, which remains a bad idea. But autonomic conditioning might have other benefits, whether it's gentle yoga, breath work, meditation, or even something as dynamic as swimming. If your spoon count and nervous system allows it, it might be worth considering. Coming up next, Dr. Asad Khan and I will be talking to Dr. Jenna Tosto Mancuso, a clinical director at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, who works closely with Dr. David Petrino. We'll be talking to her about how they use autonomic conditioning work with long haulers and what kind of results they see. I also recently asked what questions people had on this thorny subject on Twitter and got hundreds back. Now this film will be too long to answer them now, so I'm going to make a separate Q&A to follow. And one final quick plug for my second channel, Flip the Script, the link to which is in the description. Look after yourselves, until next time.